Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays of the month. The first Sunday of every month, I do a, a subscriber Sunday video where subscribers send in photos of things in their yard that they're proud of. You can send an uh, email to this email address with uh, photos for that video. I think that video is two Sundays uh, from now when you'll see all the photos that were sent to me over the last month. I think we have one more question and answer video next week and you can ask questions down below this video in the description on YouTube. Uh, and uh, I gather them up and answer them uh, the next week. Uh, there are tons of questions. I got tons of questions just all over the channel uh, this week. That tends to be the case uh, in the middle of May. Uh, it makes, makes, makes a lot of sense. This is the time of year when you start to see you know, problems uh, in the garden where you have you know, chewing things and all of, uh, uh, all of nature's uh, things are thrown at your uh, newly planted plants and, your, and, and all, that, uh, all that new foliage that's coming out on your plants is all uh, very vulnerable to chewing insects. Uh, and I get a million questions about those kinds of things. And, and the answer 95% of the time for me, 99% of the time for me, is I do nothing. Um, on, you know, I've had chewing insects on all kinds of things back here. I'm introducing the plant into the environment and then something's going to come along and do a little bit of chewing on it uh, and then but because the thing that eats that thing um, comes after you know the predators don't come first um, and so every season you're going to get some things chewed on and that kind of thing and then you're going to see those problems uh, slow down uh, you know quite a bit as uh, you know predators build up and uh, and start to take out those things. But just keep, keep that in mind, especially in a new garden here. I've watched, if you watched my uh, butterfly video yesterday, there's nothing in here that doesn't have, you know, little chewed on leaves here or there. It's just, I don't obsess about it. I don't worry about it. I know that if there's a balance out here that most of these things will take care of themselves. Nothing's gonna get killed. Uh, I'm still gonna get flowers. And so that's the answer to a lot of those questions is I do Nothing. I'm trying to uh, create a balance back here. Holly's walking behind me. I get lots of questions about why I don't let Holly eat grass. She can eat all the grass she wants to eat, but uh, I think it's kind of weird if somebody found this video. It was the very first video they were watching and the dog's just eating grass the whole time. So that's why I kind of stop her while I'm shooting videos. But other than that, I don't care what she does back here. I put in a new bird feeder over here. And so now she's just obsessed with squirrels. So uh, that's her preoccupation right now is squirrel patrol. Uh, but like I say, on the, on the uh, um, insect, and, uh, you know, those little leaf problems that people see and can kind of, kind of honestly get obsessive over, uh, I do nothing. Uh, if something was a problem to the point where the plant was in decline and it was bugging me um, just over and over and over again, that's probably just not a plant that I want. Uh, and, and I'll move on to the uh, next thing. Uh, I know that's not the answer some people want. They want the plants to, you know, all have perfect leaves. And when you buy them, you know, at the nursery or, you know, at the garden center, they are perfect, um, you know, but that was, you know, they had a team of people uh, spraying them and fertilizing them and pruning them and spacing them and loading, I mean, like on and on and on, you know, these formula, the, the plant was grown with a formula. You know, that formula doesn't exist uh, once it reaches uh, your yard as one single plant sitting there, you know, with insects looking at it and everything else looking at it, um, you know, and so again, I leave them be and uh, they, they fend for themselves and things come along and eat the things that eat my plants. So let's get started on some of the questions that I got from last week's uh, video. Uh, somebody asked, I, I did a video in the past about uh, mulch volcanoes. I've actually done, I think there's one, a video called Death by Mulch or something on the channel and then there's an additional one and I take photos of it occasionally where people pile mulch up on trees, you know, a foot and a half deep uh, or more. I think the guys are getting paid by the yard of mulch or something and that's why they're using so much of it. Of course, then homeowners see that and think that that's the way that, you know, you're supposed to mulch a tree. Uh, you're definitely not supposed to mulch a tree a foot and a half up the trunk um, of the tree. We want to see the tree, the flare. The bottom of most trees, if you go out in the woods or go out and look at old trees, right near the ground, you see a bit of a flare. Uh, a lot of the trees that you see planted in a uh, uh, commercial landscapes, you see them just disappear into the ground. The root flare's missing. Uh, it's been buried. It may have been buried in the planting of it in the nursery from one pot to another or into the field, whatever. And, or it's been buried by mulch uh, in the time that it's been planted in the ground. But we want to see that little bit of root flare at the bottom of our trees. Somebody was basically asking, what do you do about it if it's already been done to a tree? In that case, unless it was, unless it was super deep, like if, it, if the mulch was super deep and it had the possibility of composting, you know, you get a couple feet of organic material there, it could actually start composting and get hot 
and then cause the tree some damage. But if you just had an extra six or eight inches of mulch piled up on the tree, I might just consider leaving it. I've seen videos on, I saw somebody on YouTube stripping mulch away from a, a tree one time. And I, I actually thought that may, there'd be some possibility that um, maybe the sun hitting that spot that's been wet for so long uh, could cause some problem. I don't know for sure. I probably just leave it. That mulch will go away and just let it happen naturally. And then as you remulch in the future, just barely mulch it at all. But uh, for me, unless it was super deep, if it was super deep, like I say, there's some possibility it could get, actually get hot. But six inches of mulch, I'm probably just gonna leave it, let it go away on its own. Um, that way I don't take the, uh, cause that trunk's gonna be moist where that mulch was in contact with it. And I don't know if I could cause any uh, damage by uh, exposing that in, in, in some dry heat. Okay, uh, somebody asked me about their, they have hydrangeas on the west side of their house. I wanted to know when the best time to move them was because they're not blooming and they're po possibly getting too much sun. I don't know what type of hydrangea um, it is. I'm assuming um, if they're having problems on the west side, on the heat side, it must be hydrangea macrophylla, the big leaf hydrangeas. They do like part shade. I'm a big fan of putting them on the east side of the house just because uh, you can get you know, lots of morning sun on them. I don't tuck them right up against the house though, because that's too much shade. Uh, the east side of your house up against the house is too much shade for a hydrangea macrophylla, but on the east side, out from the house a little bit, so it gets an extra hour or two before the sun, before the, the house puts shade on it, is a good spot. They wanted to know about putting it on the north side. There's, I don't know where you are in the country. If, in my area, the north side of your house, uh, which is where I have my vegetable garden, you know, the sun actually goes north of us. Uh, for about six weeks in the summer and they would really cook uh, in that case. So uh, for me, I'm putting them on the uh, east side if I have a, a, an east side space and I'm in the south. Uh, in the north, we're in zone five or six, they can definitely take a little bit more sun. But uh, again, I, if that north side bakes in July, which is very possible, it may not be the best spot for them. And when to move them would be, I'll move anything anytime. So, so to ask me this question, you may be asking the wrong guy, the wrong guy this question. If you're worried about it while they're dormant uh, in the winter time, uh, would be the uh, would be the, after they lose their leaves in the fall, would be the uh, the ideal time of the year. But for me, uh, if I'm not happy with where they are, I cut 20% off the top of them and move them tomorrow. You'd be cutting flowers off hydrangeas if you did that. Uh, just keep that in mind if they haven't bloomed yet. Uh, hydrangeas, you definitely don't want to be pruning them now. Uh, but uh, if I were going to move them, I probably would prune them and just not worry about the flowers for this year. So there's a very long answer to, a, to, a short, to, 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 to that question. Best time to move them while they're dormant. Uh, Jim's time to move them the day I can go out with a shovel and move them. Okay. Um, somebody asked me about their clayera is lanky. A clayera is an uh, an evergreen shrub that we can uh, grow in the southeast. I've got a variety over here called Juliet, a variegated variety. Uh, uh, no difference between those and any other leafy evergreen shrub uh, if it's thin. Uh, they bought them in distress last year, so they were already thin. They pruned them back in March, and they're still thin. Wanted to know what to do about it. Time, that's the only thing you can do. Leafy evergreen shrubs will recover from those types of things. You pruned them at the right time, it's been super cool for most people since then, so they, that's probably why you haven't seen any response yet. Once it's uh, you know up in the up, you know mid and upper 80s, I think you'll probably see um, those clay are like 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 it hot. So I think you'll see them start to respond, but it may take a couple years for you know those types of th repairs to happen uh, to plants uh, when they're super thin and they have very few leaves on them. Okay, uh, somebody asked me they got two uh, red bud varieties. Um, two of the newer ones, um, the, uh, that variegated, the Carolina Sweetheart, the variegated one, and uh, one of the gold, Hearts of Gold or something, that, the, one of the gold ones. Uh, and I've got one of the uh, uh, gold weeping ones here. I think you can see it in the frame. I haven't planted it yet, but planting it soon. Uh, and wanted to know if there would be some problem having them close together, whether they would cross. It won't change that plant, but if plants, um, Use the, the seed, if they were going to cross and make seed, the seed would be a different plant, but not the, not the two plants uh, that you have. They're going to be the exact same. But seed they produced, if they're capable of producing seed, a lot of these new hybrids are not capable. You know, they're sterile cultivars, but um, the seed they produced would not be true uh, to the, uh, you know, what variety the tree is, but the, but the trees wouldn't, it, the trees themselves would not change. So no, 
And interestingly, I think this Thursday, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this Thursday, I'm uh, meeting with uh, Danny Werner, who uh, introduced uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these red buds. Uh, and that's going to be super interesting. Um, he's going to show me around his place. I'm hoping he's got a few secret plants because he's he's still working hard at uh, introducing uh, new plant material. So some of it I won't be able to show you. Uh, and uh, but the things that he's already introduced, um, I will be able to. That flamethrower red bud that you saw in Bree's video, and um, you know, lot, lots of plants that he's introduced. Some of the dwarf butterfly bushes, the sterile cultivars, the dwarf butterfly bushes, he did. Um, so that's going to be that, that, that's going to be a. I'm looking forward to Thursday. Somebody asked me about um, they bought some emerald arborvita, and due to budget, they only bought they were two to three feet in height, um, and they wanted to know how to get them to grow faster. One concerning thing in the question was I water them every day. Uh, be careful. Anytime I hear that, I, I immediately uh, you know think that they're going to eventually drown them. So uh, water them when they need water, but water them well. I'm not telling you not to water them, but water them well when they need water. Okay, not uh. Um, I'd be careful watering them uh, every single day. There's nothing you can do to get them to grow faster. I actually prefer to buy plants that size. I think over the long haul, a two to three foot tall emerald arborvita put in and taken, you know, in a bed space, not in a lawn, and uh, uh, grown out in that space will be a tougher plant than having bought six to eight foot field grown ones. Um, I think you'll find that uh, over the long haul, yours will be healthier than having bought them larger anyway. But it is gonna take some patience. Conif those con types of conifers are not in a big giant hurry to, uh, to grow. But uh, be careful with the watering. Okay, somebody asked me, I talked about that shade cloth in last week's question and answer and wanted to know where to get them. You can, there's several um, nursery supply um, online places. The Grower Solution is one, um, Greenhouse Nurseries, Greenhouse Megastore, that's one. Um, and they allow you to set the, um, put in the size of the shade cloth you want, and then the, I think the amount of grommets, or maybe you can make the grommets two feet apart or three feet apart, that kind of thing, but you can get, and then you pick the uh, shade percentage uh, that you want. That one over there is a 40% uh, shade cloth. Okay, um, I got a ton of questions on the video that I put up Wednesday where I just covered up the grass in the front yard uh, with the uh, compost and mulch and uh, didn't kill it first. I didn't, get I didn't get questions on last week's video about that. I got them in the Wednesday video, and then I got some people asked me how to get rid of grass before they were uh, doing beds. I have, uh, this is a uh, rye, uh, which the rye part of this is going to die and some fescue mixed into it. They're just wimpy grasses here in the Southeast. This annual rye was gonna die as soon as it got hot anyway. It's weirdly not gotten hot, but um, it should have been dead already. And the, uh, uh, fescue is just totally wimpy. So, you know, out there, I put down my compost, about an inch of compost, which laid most of that grass down. Um, and then I mulched pretty thick over the top of it where that maple had come down and I had all the chipped up pieces uh, from the maple. Uh, that's just because that was a very wimpy type of grass. I mean, if, if I had Bermuda grass or any other serious weeds uh, this time of year, I don't think you could smother them like that. Well, let's say, you, let's say you did what I did on those things. You'd kill some percentage of it, but a lot of it would come back up through it. Uh, the best way to go about those things is, you know, either with a tiller, you know, that first time through, um, you know, just dislodging the stuff from the ground. I had that little electric tiller. I did a one day landscape job uh, last year at a friend's house and I used that, um, that electric tiller and I just ran over it and then I raked up the grass and then I ran over it again and then I raked up the grass. I may have done it a third time. Doesn't take long. All I was doing was scraping the top, you know, down about two inches. I wasn't trying to till six inches deep. And I got 95% of it uh, out before I uh, composted and mulched. So that's one technique. You can use a pickaxe or a flat shovel. Uh, you, can buy, you can rent a sod cutter. Obviously you can spray it. Um, you can distress it. The vinegar, that vinegar solution, and I did a video on it, really won't, doesn't kill uh, very well. But if you use the vinegar solution and then put the compost over it and then put the mulch over it, uh, that combo uh, might be enough to uh, kill most of the grass. So a lot of different approaches to it. The main thing is, is just to scalp it super, super short, whatever grass you're trying to kill. And then the other technique lots of people use is a no dig uh, bed method where you just take cardboard boxes, uh, you know, and, and lay them flat across that grass after you cut it down really short and then build your compost and your mulch up on top of that. And uh, those boxes, 
um, will break down and then during that process should kill most of that material under it. Some things will come through that too. It depends on what's, what's, uh, what's there. But so you got that no dig method with the cardboard boxes or some mechanical method. And like I said, that electric tiller, I have it listed in my Amazon store below. It's like 110 bucks. I break that. I've, I've used it four times since I got here and lots of times at the other house. Uh, I don't do a lot of tilling, but it's surprising how many times I have, um, a need has popped up. Uh, where I've been able to use that little, I don't know, $120. I don't know how much it is now, maybe more than that, but it was like $120 when I bought it. Okay, another long answer from Jim. Uh, somebody asked me um, if I have a video on my greenhouse. I mentioned this, it's just a frame. It's not, not anything yet. Um, and I must've thought I had already had this greenhouse over here. Actually, the very first video I ever put on my channel is about my greenhouse, my propagation video at my old nursery. I had a very large, um, pretty sophisticated, uh, uh, system for uh, rooting cuttings there. So if you want to go back and watch the very first video I put up, it's probably not very good, but it's about uh, about uh, greenhouse propagation uh, in a nursery in a nursery setting. Um, and that was quite that's quite a big house. Somebody asked me about um, they planted uh, some blue star uh, lithodora, which is a ground cover uh, flocks um, ground cover it, similar to ground cover flocks blooms a little later um, this blue star variety has little blue flowers on it wanted to know if they had made a mistake because it can uh, would it be aggressive I never found that uh, to be an aggre a really aggressive um, uh, perennial it's a little evergreen ground cover very similar to ground cover flocks really I know out in the west I think that thing can uh, can be kind of uh, aggressive, but here in the Southeast, I haven't found it to be that aggressive. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it if it, you can cut it back whenever. Okay, um, somebody asked me, oh, if they have sandy soils, should they still plant high? I always talk about planting plants high, planting plants high. That would totally depend on where you are. Eastern North Carolina has a very high water table. So does Eastern uh, uh, South Carolina and Georgia. You get down toward coastal areas, um, the water, you can dig a hole and water fills it up. So I still plant high in those situations. The other thing about the southeastern United States, whether you have sand soils or clay soils, is we can get, um, we can get a tropical storm in September that drops eight inches of rain on us, followed by a hurricane a week later that drops six inches on us, and then, and then a week's worth of rain. And that's happened before, you know, where we can get 20 to 30 inches of rain in a, in a, in a six or eight week span, even in your, in, even in your sandy soils, uh, you're going to have a problem. So yes, I plant high, uh, regardless in the Southeast, uh, just because I'm planning on massive rainfall events, uh, happening at some point, you will have to water a little more, uh, than you would have if you planted them flush. Okay. Um, I addressed Holly eating grass. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked me about an oak that was leafing out slow. Uh, probably has leafed out a little more this past week because we did have a little bit warmer weather. This is the weirdest year I've ever seen. Back in January, I was putting photos on Instagram of things that were blooming months ahead of time, months ahead of time. But then it, the breaks got applied in March and it's been super cool ever since. And now for the first time I've ever seen uh, we have blueberries coming off the plants and the strawberries are still producing. <laughs> it's just like the strawberries should have been burned out here already and you know for the blueberry time. So it's a really weird year. It's the slowest start to summer I've ever seen. But back in January, it looked like it was gonna be the fastest start we ever had. It's just the brakes got applied, the nighttime temperatures have been so cool. And uh, that's why things have been kind of slow to wake up and get going. I've got lots of uh, heat loving, uh, sun loving um, things out here that would definitely be further along. Lantana is really not blooming, it's almost June. Uh, so, uh, uh, but that should correct itself pretty quick. I, I think it will, uh, you know, get days in the 80s, consistently in 90s soon enough. So this will be the last one uh, for this week. Somebody asked me about a tree in zone, uh, for zone eight in a wet area or riparian area, uh, an area that holds some water. Um, uh, red maples will work, river birches, bald cypress, sweet bay magnolias. There's a long list of trees uh, that will take um, wetter areas uh, in the south. Uh, obviously willows. They said they had some willows that were declining and that was why they were asking the question. Uh, you still need to plant them up a little bit when you plant them uh, in those wet areas. It's interesting that plants, I find that plants that like uh, riparian areas or wet areas, uh, if they just come up on their own, they're like great. Uh, but um, if you just go in there and stick them in the water, <laughs> they don't necessarily do quite as well. 
And so, uh, you know, I would mound them up just slightly, uh, it, you know, in those spaces, make sure you keep the crown actually out of the water. It will, you'll be buying a tree that did not come out of a bog. You know, it wasn't transplanted from one bog to your bog. Uh, it's gonna come out of a uh, container. I got something flying around my ear. Uh, something, it's gonna be coming out of a container that was grown like any other shrub. So it's not gonna like just being poked into, you know, into that situation. So maybe during a drier time of year, uh, I would do it, you know, probably now uh, and, and into uh, early to midsummer and mound it up just slightly uh, to keep the crown uh, always out of the water. But um, those are, like I say, red maples, river birches, sweet bay magnolias. Uh, what else have I, uh, um, of all of the oaks, um, pin oaks, um, you know, like, uh, like wetter areas. So, okay. Thank you very much for participating uh, in these question and answer videos. You can ask questions down below and uh, next week will be another question and answer video. Thanks for watching.